Jim Crow has less to do with the basic structure of our society than the language that we use to justify it. In the era of colorblindness, it is no longer, no longer socially permissible to use race explicitly as a justification for discrimination, exclusion, and social contempt. So we don't. Rather, we rely on race. We use our criminal justice system to label people of color as criminals and then engage in all of the practices we supposedly left behind. In the book by Michelle Alexander, The New Jim Crow, it states that there are more African Americans today, African American men today, in the correctional system than there were in the days of slavery in the 1850s, which I think is absolutely insane. <laughs> Perfectly legal to just, and, and now with this group of people, and not just African American men, but that is the largest group of these people, people that are labeled criminals, convicted felons, it's perfectly legal to discriminate against them in the exact same way that we discriminated against African Americans in the civil rights movements. We can't, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Oh, they, they are labeled for life. They are locked in and locked out. They experience employment discrimination. They experience housing discrimination. They are excluded from the right to vote and the right to be a part of juries, which then creates not as much diversity in juries. So then the people that are being judged are these people that we're speaking about, and how fair is that? <laughs> <laughs> it just doesn't uh, seem right to him. But as Michelle puts it, as a criminal, you have scarcely more rights and arguably less respect than a black man in Alabama at the height of Jim Crow. We have not ended ra the racial caste system in America. We have merely redefined it. So many of you are thinking a criminal is a criminal. That they, they're in jail and they're in prison because that's where they belong. They're the ones creating problems, they're the ones choosing to do these acts. This, you know, this isn't discrimination, this is, we're being protected in our society, this is our protection. And that's exactly why this racial caste system works. Because when I say criminal, I'm not talking about murderers, I'm not talking about rapists, I'm not talking about child molesters, and I am not talking about violent criminals of any kind. I'm talking about people with simple drug convictions, simple possessions. 82% of the people sent to prison have nonviolent crimes, mostly drug offenders. We now also know that drug addiction is a disease, and they have found that prison does not rehabilitate people. It, it actually perpetuates the cycle. People get out, they're convicted, they have all of these things running against them, they can't get a home, they can't get a job, they are labeled with all of these things. Right. What do we expect? Yes. What are they supposed to do? So the biggest myth, uh, one of the biggest myths about incarceration is that it is driven by crime, mates, crime rates. That's actually not true. Prison populations have quintupled in the last 30 years for reasons that have little to do with crime rates. Historically, crime rates have gone down, yet incarcerates, incarceration rates have soared, especially for black men. Black males have a 32% chance of serving time in prison, while white males have a 6% chance. This is according to the Bureau of Labor and Statistics. Not by accident, the war on drugs, which is what all of this is in the name of, the war on drugs, we, we make it all illegal, we'll rid the world of them. So they think. But not by accident, the war on drugs has been waged in poor, exclusively almost, in poor communities, uh, particularly communities of color. And even though contrary to popular belief, a black person is no more likely to partake in drug use or the selling of drugs than a white person. In fact, actually data shows that a white youth is more likely to engage in drug use and the sale of drugs than black youth. Looking at our prisons, though, you would never, ever guess that. In some states, 80 to 90% of the prison population is made up of African-American inmates. 
How is this when only 12 to 13 percent of our population is made up by African American people? The disparities, I believe, are shocking. This graph here shows you this is the percentage in our country of white people, black people, and Latinos, or Hispanic Latinos. This here shows the percentage of these groups in, that are incarcerated. As you can see, even though there's only 12 to 13 percent of African American people in our country, they are the largest group of people that are incarcerated in this country. And according to the National Center for Addiction and Substance Abuse at Columbia University, more than 800,000 people in the criminal justice system would benefit from substance abuse treatment, yet less than 150,000 receive it. And this also shows the percentage of incarcerations with ethnicity. Today, our criminal justice system is really a tool for racism and segregation. What does it mean that the leader of the free world locks up its black males at a rate of 5.8 times more than most of the openly racist countries in America, such as South America, I mean in the world, such as South Africa, excuse me. So there are other countries that are very openly racist and we lock our my people of color and you know different ethnicities up more than they do. And there's this. We we ask Again, you know, people ask our, we ask ourselves, <laughs> why is this, why is this happening like this? Is this group committing more crimes? Are they doing more drugs? Why is this happening? And it is partly due to laws such as the stop and frisk laws that they have, especially this is in uh, New York, um, that they are allowed to just stop and stop and, and search somebody. And it's, it's in poor communities, which unfortunately have more black and Latino people in those communities. Mm -hmm. So this is why they are eight times more likely to be stopped. This was in, this was a statistics from New York, but this is true around the country. So in conclusion, I ask you to think about what I've discussed today. I ask you to think about it with an open and compassionate heart. Is racism in, a real, in America really all that different than it was 150 years ago? The manner in which we practice it might be different but the manner in how people have to live with it really isn't. I discussed three speakers, Frederick Douglass, Julian Bond, and Michelle Alexander. They have all fought to give the fight for equality and victims of racism a voice. The fight must continue. You may look at me and think, I'm not black, obviously. I'm not a man. <laughs> Why did I choose this over maybe the struggle that my ancestors faced? That's right, all races. I believe we've all faced adversity. We've all made mistakes. We've all made our choices in life, some of which we regret. Many of us are allowed to continue on with life and have a second chance. But so many people in our country are not. Many of us have committed a lot of these crimes that these people are caught for, but since we were doing them uh, in our dorm on the college campus with a large group of white people experimenting with drugs or underage drinking, we just weren't caught for them. Are we really that different than these people? They've decided that it's not unconstitutional to send somebody to prison for their first time drug possession offense. For life. For life? For life in Michigan. That's some shit. And <laughs> so are we really that different? Are we really all perfect? Have we really, has, has everybody, can everyone in here really say that they have never broken a law? Maybe you just weren't caught for it. So I ask you to think about that today and have an open and compassionate heart for your fellow human, no matter what color or what they've done in their past.